So good morning, everybody. My name is Lilia McEnany, and I am an assistant curator at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, Laboratory of Anthropology. And as you all know, we are here today con to continue our lecture series surrounding our current exhibition, Clearly Indigenous Native Visions Reimagining Glass. Um, to begin, I would like to briefly acknowledge the place where this conversation is happening, at least on my end, and even though we are not physically at the museum today and are in a virtual space, in Ogopoge within the Tewa world. As a non-Native person living in so-called Santa Fe, I am a guest in the ancestral homelands of the Tewa people, and I wish to acknowledge all of the Indigenous people and communities, Pueblo Dene, Apache, and so many others, past, present, and future, who walk on these lands and steward these places, and I would encourage everybody watching here today to reflect on the lands on which you reside and occupy. So we are so pleased to be joined this morning by Angela Babby. Um, Angela is a Lakota award-winning artist who has revived and combined ancient techniques into a unique style, creating enameled glass mosaics, which are kiln-fired. Her glass-on-glass -glass approach combines her love of painting with the luminosity and saturation of color that can be achieved when working with glass. And a hallmark of her work is that it strikes the viewer with its emotional content, which I know we will be talking a lot about today. Um, so as always, a recording of this program will be made available on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks, so keep an eye out on our Facebook page and monthly newsletter for that link and announcements about other upcoming programs around this exhibition and others. So to start us off, I'm going to hand it over to Angela so that she can introduce herself and her work. And then we're going to continue by playing a pre-recorded studio tour that she prepared for us and talk about a few individual pieces that are on display at Mayak. And then we will open it up to conversation, like I said. So with that, um, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And I'll hand it over to Angela. Hello, uh, I'm Angela Babby and I'm a glass mosaic artist. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, read, read you a description of how I came to glass and where I'm from. And um, I, I, I'm just more comfortable reading it to you concisely. So here we go. Uh, I was born in Everett, Washington and my family came from Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Uh, my grandfather's allotment was along the White River, and my great-grandmother's home is over by Wambly in South Dakota. My cousin still lives there on my great-grandma's place. My grandpa took his family off the Pine Ridge Reservation during the depths of the Great Depression at the urging of a priest at the Holy Rosary Mission, which is now the location of the Red Cloud School. We were disconnected from our genealogical history for a long time. We visited our family and our grandparents' graves only occasionally, but we were always told that we were related to Chief Red Cloud. But as kids, we just weren't really that interested in history, you know, how teenagers are. And so we moved around a lot because my dad worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And during my childhood, we lived in Warm Springs, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, Richmond, Virginia, Aberdeen, South Dakota, and then back to Portland, Oregon, where I went to high school. My parents had moved to Montana, and so I moved to Billings, Montana, where I live now, and went to college. I had studied many different majors, started at two different colleges, but couldn't visualize myself working in a lab or an office. And so uh, when I got to Billings, I went to work at a fabric store and became the manager and didn't see a future there. And finally took some art classes at MSU Billings where I graduated from college finally. And you know, when I started taking art classes, I suddenly felt like I had found my place in the world. And despite learn, earning an art degree, I wasn't considering working as fine arts. I uh, didn't, it didn't seem practical the way I was raised and I had never known a professional working artist. Um, it was a sculpture class at, at college where I was having trouble having ideas without color, where I start, I talked to a friend of mine who knew how to do stained glass. And I learned for the first time of bullseye stained glass factory. And so at college, I made wood and stained glass sculptures. After college, I thought I needed to be in a big city to pursue an art career. I moved to Seattle where I learned to picture frame and worked there for quite a while. 
Later, I moved back to Portland where I went to work for the Bullseye Stained Glass Company. And I learned all about glass there. I had to apply twice to get the job because I had no experience. And um, I experienced a stellar rise and ended up in a year and a half becoming the head of quality control. And I loved working there. After a health scare though, I, that I attributed to the chemicals used in glass manufacturing, I moved to Phoenix, Arizona, and I pursued a full-time art career. Uh, and I just figured it was now or never, give it a try. Um, so I started my very own decorative painting business and I was working constantly. I got burned out and decided to take a pottery class. And while I was there, I only went to like one or two of the classes, but one of the students said, oh, that's so good. You should try to get into the herd Indian market. And I had never been to a native art market at that time. And I applied, I got in on my first try and attended the first one I ever attended, I was in it. And I saw all these people that were like me there. And um, at the same time, coincidentally, my dad was uh, working with my cousin to research and write a book on my family's genealogy, which they eventually sent to the Library of Congress uh, to be on record. And it was this new knowledge that really inspired my work from that point forward. Rainy outdoor setting at the herd is what made me switch over to glass, having to reframe all my watercolors. And, and I, I decided if I'm gonna do this, it's gonna be durable and waterproof. So that's how I really came to switching 100% to glass. Um, so, and glass also, it, it just, it did all kinds of things that you can't plan. And it, and it gets rid of any control you have as a painter because at some point in time, you have to decide it's done. And, and it, it just, it was better for me painting wise because I never felt like my paintings were done. It's very frustrating. So um, let's see, my first mosaic artwork was a medicine bottle. And that was kind of the, the picture that you see for this uh, talk here. Um, and, and by doing that first one, it made me want to see what it would look like if I could integrate more detail into my images. And that's what got me to uh, start doing enameling work was that first image. Um, so let's see. Anyway, I got robbed in Phoenix, ended up moving back to Montana and thought my career, my art career was over. But, uh, and the first year I couldn't, do any of the art markets, but um, Swaya ended up awarding me a fellowship and I got back into the show right away when I applied again. So I, I figured out that living in Montana did not make me unable to, to practice art, but actually led me back to my reservation. Um, I, I finally could start to do the shows in South Dakota. And I started with the Red Cloud Art Show and um, ended up getting my largest commission to date, which is at the Red Cloud School, where my family's from. And I won my first festive show at the Native Pop in Rapid City. And then I could go on and do the Northern Plains Indian Art Market, uh, where I ended up figuring out that a lot of my problems were stemming from my very low budget presentation. And so that's when I, uh, figured out that I was going to definitely continue to be an artist and I, I needed to have really good lighting on my work. So that's, that's pretty much in a nutshell what, uh, how I came to work in glass. That was fantastic. Thank you. Um, I have so many questions mm -hmm. based on what you just shared, but um, I really loved how you said you found your, you found your place in the world um, through your art classes in school. So um, we can revisit all of that a little bit later on in the program, but for now, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and we're going, going to take a walk through your studio. So here we are going into my studio and in my little studio, not very big. And up here on the wall, we'll see the pattern that was made. 
for the piece that I just showed you. Um, and generally speaking, I number all the pieces on this one. I didn't do quite all of them. But as you'll see, you know, usually you'll see someone's studio and it's all neat and tidy. This has been all cleaned up. This is a really messy medium and it's, it's harder and harder to keep it organized because you keep getting more and more small pieces. Um, so just kind of show you around first, see lots of glass. Um, some fusible materials as well, the frit and whatnot. So here we have some of the pieces that I'm working on right now. This is just a single piece of glass that has been enameled. It's not quite done yet. It's got to be re-fired. It's had one firing so far. And this is, of course, a cut piece. It's all cut. It's got a little bit of the enameling started on there, but it's going to fire to a different color. But those, that's all cut. This one also is cut. And then after I had the face all cut, I noticed there was a flaw in it, so I had to recut that. Uh, many times you'll have to recut things because they're just not working. So I'll study this piece and I'll decide what I'm going to do with this. I can enamel into it and shade it and make it textured or add another color, anything that I can think of. And then we'll come down here. This piece is one of my only uh, fused gla glass pieces. So it's uh, a fused glass piece. It's a platter and it never felt done to me. So it's, it's, I'm going to go ahead and make another platter to, to put behind it to make it stand out. Um, because it's made out of transparent glass, iridized glass. And I want it to be, you know, as good as it can be. And I really feel like it needs to be backed up with white. So I finally have a kiln that's big enough to where I can make that that second platter piece. So then we have all kinds of different colors and all different kinds of glass. I like to have it out so I can kind of go through it and then put it all out and study it together. So there we've got, I'm going to start doing some experimentation with the frit, which is uh, melted into fusible glasses. And that'll be a whole nother thing. So there's that. And then this is one of my favorite glasses. So I'm getting ready to cut that. It's iridescent clear ripple. And then here we have a bunch of different experiments. So when I'm when I'm getting ready to start a piece, I'll, if I need to uh, figure out whether I've made the right color, I'll have to mix it up and then uh, paint it onto a piece of glass and fire it to see what color it's going to be. Because you don't really know exactly what you've got until it's fired in. And then this piece here is just a little mock-up of some of the different frets, the little pieces of glass melted together to see what they, what colors they look like and what they do when they melt into the glass. So you'll see a color reaction around that turquoise that I think is really fun and interesting. So the enamels that I've mixed up here, uh, they come in a powder form. So it's just a powder. And then you mix it with a medium, which we'll see, let's see. 
Oh, I don't see it here. Anyway, it's it's a medium that you mix with it, and then it turns into kind of a paint, and you could thin that with water. Um, and that's really experimentation where you figure out, you know, what happens when you thin out the paint. So these are some um, stained glass works that I mocked up for a project that I I didn't end up getting, but I really like these, but they're super labor intensive because they're two sided. Because I never liked the idea that the other side didn't have anything on it. Oops, couldn't quite do that. Hold on. So there you see that side. And then you have the other side as well. And it's see through. So that's stained glass as opposed to mosaic, which I I love mosaic. This is um, attempting to uh, mock up an iron large frame for a huge window because I really don't like the straight lines coming across stained glass if I was going to do a really large window. But yeah, these are enameled on both sides, so they look the same looking in and out. Here's my little uh, grinding station with the band, diamond band saw, or yeah, and the grinder. Very simple tools, mostly, pretty much everything I do is hand cut and then just ground with the, with the little grinder. And so this is what I'm doing for a friend. So this is the pattern that I mock up that I want. And it's for from one of his photographs that his daughter loves. His name's John Gosen Center. Um, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna design this so that it it uh, is really modern. I, I haven't decided on all the colors, but I've got the sky kind of cut up here. So each, each piece has to be cut out and then you lay this onto a piece of glass. I'm showing you the whole darn thing, even though you probably could tell. So you lay that onto the glass and then you cut it out. You, cut, you draw that on there and then you cut it out and then you grind it. And you do all those different pieces that way. And then if you're enameling, you take the piece and you paint it with the enamels. So this is all the little pieces cut out, obviously. And then after it's fired, you can get like the, you can figure out what the exact colors are, but then it might not be finished. So you might have to go back and go back in and do what you think you need to do to it and refire it. A lot of times I'll have to do three different firings four different firings if it's really being a bugger. And you you just have to keep working it till it works because it decides when it's done. So this is the scene of the crime and it's not too exciting, but <laughs> people seem to want to see it and that's it. So thanks for thanks for stopping in and Thank you for your interest. This is my latest uh, mosaic without any enameling on it. It's a landscape, obviously. Um, so it's really messing around with what would happen when you combine all of these different kinds of really interesting glasses, studying the relationships between different colors and patterns and seeing how they work. So each artwork that I make, it's kind of a, a test that goes into my library that kind of shows me what color interactions do. So this particular piece was inspired by this little miniature up here. And what you'll notice is I changed the overall glasses so that the shadows were purple in this in this larger one. So you can notice 
what kind of overall interactions you get. And you just don't really know what it's going to look like till you complete it. So that's kind of one of the difficulties with this medium is that you have to finish something to really study what's going to go on. So this first one, this miniature I was really happy with, um, it used a sparkle green for the shadows. Um, so then the larger experiment was all about the purple. So the river in there is made out of iridescent favorite glass. So when you walk around the piece, it, it does all kinds of shiny things. So it's not just a static piece like you see in the photographs of them. Great. So thank you for that. Um, I think that provided a really wonderful insight into your process. Um, and so we have one question that's come in that I think we should maybe talk about before we start talking about the individual pieces um, from Ellen, who asks, how do you fire a piece when it is enameled on both sides and at what temperature? Uh, when it's enameled on both sides. You actually, if you have if you have the shelf paper in there, you can paint both sides and and have it have it in there. So you have to paint one side, then you flip it over, paint the other side, and refire it. So those those pieces ended up getting fired more than once. Uh, yeah, the it's so complicated to do that because also when you enamel, I'll, I'll just warn you against this. I didn't realize, cause I don't like uh, 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 solder to be that bright silver. So um, the, the, the oh, I'm just lapsing out on, on words here. The, the antiquing stuff you put on there, you know what I'm talking about. It actually is, the enemy of, of uh, glass can be stained by it, but it can also remove enameling. So that was another part of the nightmare of that experiment. Um, but yeah, you have to, you, you paint one whole side, fire it, then you paint the other side, fire it. And uh, yeah, you just need to definitely have shelf paper, the thin shelf paper, so it doesn't stick if that makes sense. Yes, that does make sense. Um, but we do All have right. a question just on this same topic of um, enamel, just someone asking what type of enamel that you do use. I use Thompson enamel and there's all different kinds. Thompson is, is a low fire. There's several different kinds they sell, but I use the, they, they tell you which one's for bullseye for the 90 expansion. Um, and I, I started with that. It works great. Um, and then there's a medium that they sell right there if you get their catalog. So they're great. Fantastic. Um, so I'm sure we'll, we will return to the question of process a little bit later on. But for now, I would love um, to ask you to speak about a few different pieces that are in the Mayak um, exhibition. So I'm going to share my screen again. So that is literally the first piece that I made. And when I, I it, it was inspired by Medicine Bottle, who is just this tragic figure in, he's a Dakota warrior. Uh, they killed the largest mass execution in, in American history was the 38 plus two. And the two were Medicine Bottle, this man, and little six. And, uh, I, I, you know, the figures in the back are, are uh, all of the people that all the other chiefs that were killed. And it, it was just like this idea came to me fully formed with the, with that feather design in there. But that is the piece that made me want to um, learn how to enamel. I mean, I love this piece, but when I took it to the shows, I, I hauled it to like I think it was five years before it finally got um, bought by the Aka Lakota Museum in, in South Dakota. Um, and 
people would look at it and they'd say, oh, yuck, it's Indian Frankenstein. So, I mean, it, you know, that hurt my feelings, but I obviously connected with the people with what, you know, art does not need to be beautiful. <laughs> so that's that piece. Yeah, I was really amazed um, to learn that this was the first piece that you ever did. It's ac absolutely spectacular in the story that it's sharing about the Dakota 38 plus two. And um, I, it is just visually spectacular from my perspective. And it's just really incredible to me that this was the first one that you've ever done. If you ever get out to the Aka Lakota Museum, it's in the middle of nowhere in the center if you're headed to South Dakota for to go to the like the the Black Hills and all that other stuff that museum is so spectacular they've got quite a bit of my early works and it's so much better in person I mean it's it's hard to capture these it really is yeah, and you could tell that, especially in your video where you were moving around and seeing how the different light reflects off of the different um, aspects of it. So mm -hmm. yes, a plug for visiting um, the exhibition in person. So you can't see this piece, obviously, at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture right now, but you can see this one. Yes. So this one was it, it was created for a group show of all Lakota artists to to um, talk about the Wounded Knee Massacre. And, you know, I had been raised with these pictures, but I had done a, a, a solo show at the um, uh, South Dakota Art Museum in Brookings. And um, they had these pictures in super high resolution. And I never knew that that, I thought it was a pile of blankets in the black and white. And when I blew it up and saw those, those women's faces, it was just profoundly moving. And so this was the piece that I made for this group show that um, Cairns, uh, the Center for Indian Arts and Native Studies in, in uh, Martin, South Dakota. He's been doing all of these educational shows and I really love this piece. It's very sad, but it, 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 I, I really think it's important. For those of the um, people in the audience who might not be familiar with the image, can you talk a little bit about that, the original image? So, yes, so what they did is they, they took all of these photographs of the, the battlefield where they literally mowed down uh, the entirety of, of uh, Blackfoot, or excuse me, uh, oh, I'm having a lapse here. They, they mowed down these people that they had been chasing from way up in, in uh, I think it was in Minnesota where they started out, but they were running away from the military all the way down to to meet up with Red Cloud's band at Pine Ridge and they attacked them at Wounded Knee. And so these pictures were taken um, the next morning as they were cleaning up this devastation of murder. And yeah, I just, uh, it's, it's just the most tragic, tragic thing. And I've learned since that this was not the only time that they did this. Uh, and I, you know, a lot of that history is just not known even by Native Americans. And, and so the more we can put these images out there and talk about what really happened, um, I, 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 you know, it's, it's the people are still here and we need to educate people so that they understand that this can happen to anyone. And, and especially during what's going on in our country right now, we need to understand that, you know, this, that people can come and kill you if they want what you have. And it's quite, fright quite frightening that we're trying to get rid of history and, and not teach people about what's gone on in the past. So I think we are at a, at a, 
crossroads here where I, I think we are going to start learning more because people are pushing forward to educate. Absolutely. And I think that's really the power of your work is that you're dealing with these incredibly difficult um, histories that are not taught to the general public um, and you're making them really visually accessible and um, approachable um, by looking at this image and the viewers really ask to ask what is going on here and that is a entry point into learning about the histories of settler colonialism in this context. Another reason, another reason why I like glass, I love glass, is that it's like this beautiful, beautiful material that sucks you in and you look at it and it's beautiful and then you wonder, well, what is this, what is this talking about? And so that that's why I love glass. Yes, absolutely. So the next piece I'd like to talk about is this one. Yes, this a client of mine ended up sending me this book of black and white portraits that I, uh, really old ones that I had never seen before. And she was on the back of this book, this little, you know, like eight by eight picture of her. And I just fell in love with her immediately. And I'm a dog fanatic. And I love that little husky dog. And so this is like all my favorite things put together with the message of concern for the melting of the ice caps and the canaries in the coal mine that are the indigenous people up there. And uh, then the background is all my favorite model glass is the ground. So most of that glass that's used on the ground is, is uh, created with this glass that grows those models. And I tried to cut it out so, well, it, it was cut out so the look of the entire sheet is maintained, even though it's in a triangular pattern, which is, I, I use that as a, a, a design that are prayers. So all of the little triangular patterns represent a prayer. Um, so, but I wanted to maintain that uh, pattern that that sheet of glass comes in and it's supposed to be just this caramel color but the ther the thermal history of the sheet ends up turning blue and purple and brown and golden I just I've always loved that glass since I worked at the factory and in fact when I was working at Bullseye they they were calling that curious and discounting it when it came out like that and I said they were crazy. That's the best glass. <laughs> so, wow. yeah, and I think this piece similarly speaks to um, the history of photography um, of Indigenous people by non-Native people, and really, um, your work does a lot of important legwork in reclaiming these images and making them more potent and. Um, just again, asking people to really reflect on what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. So finally, we have this one. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. So this one, the, my first Santa Fe market, I got in on my first try and I, I didn't have hardly any work. And so I made this because I figured you're not gonna sell anything there. It was your first show. And so uh, I was terrified. Um, I'd never even really been to Santa Fe and then I'm in this, this sh huge show. And so I made this, it was actually 36 by 48 acrylic painting. And, and I made it because I loved it and I would want to live with it forever. And if it didn't sell, I wouldn't care. And so I went to the show with my acrylic painting and it didn't sell. And so I was hauling it back home. When I got back home, someone called and said they wanted it. So I had to mail it to them, which was, that was very happy day. And I always wanted to revisit the image after I started working in glass exclusively. And so I, I ended up uh, redesigning it, improving things that I didn't like about the original image and creating it out of glass. This one, I thought it would be easy because I was familiar with the design. I'd, I'd love it. And 
it was very, very challenging to make it do what the, the initial painting did, but I mainly wanted to do it in glass to take advantage of the texture for the buffalo robe that they're wrapped in. But then there was this transition between the buffalo robe with the sky. So that was, I mean, it was really, really challenging. Every single piece in there ended up being wanted to be fired four times. So it, it was my, my masterpiece. And more and more, I'm letting more of the glass show through. This one is entirely enamel. Fantastic. Okay. So thank you for sharing all of that. Um, mm -hmm. That was really fantastic. We have a lot of questions that are coming into the chat. Um, well, we have a lot of comments just sharing people's awe at your work and your process. Um, so thank you everybody for sending those in. Um, the first one that I would like to go to is a, another process question, um, which is from Sally who asks what temperature you are firing at. I fire at uh, 1100 for 15 and then hold for 15 and that's it. And you know, to tell the truth, I have had the most Neanderthal kiln from the get-go. I've had it for like 25 years and it doesn't ha even have a controller on it. All it has is a temperature gauge. Um, you know, the, getting to know all of the enamels, that takes a while. You know, you'll burn things off if you hold it too long. Each color is kind of different. Um, there, there's different problems that you have with different colors. So, uh, but yeah, 1100 hold for 15 and then that's it. Great. So we have a question from Joanne who's asking specifically how each firing changes the glass. You mentioned just now that certain pieces were required to be fired four times. So can you just talk a little bit about why that would be required? Well, when you're doing, um, faces, you, you, it's, there's so little there and you can't see it till it's fired. And then once it's fired, it's, it's really hard to get it. You can fix it. I'll give you a way that, that I'll give away this, this, uh, this thing that I learned. I was talking about the, the uh, stained glass and it's not flux. I'm having trouble remembering patina. Patina is poison <laughs> to uh, enamel. So if you're gonna antique your antique your uh, 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 solder, you better be careful with it. It's very yeah. You I learned everything the hard way, but what that told me is if you did something you want to get rid of, that poison patina could possibly get rid of it. Maybe. So. Um, I forgot the question now, I got distracted, <laughs> sorry. How each firing changes the glass. Uh, so when you're doing a face, you need to slowly build it up so that you can see what you're doing. Um, uh, it, 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 it doesn't really change the glass that much because it's not going to a full fire, a full fuse. Um, the, you know, but, but when you fire it four times, it's because each time you come back and it's done firing, you see that it would be better if it had another fire. So you just have to keep doing it till it does what you want it to. That's what I'm, that's what happens. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Rita that asks how you um, do the shadows in the work. Uh, it depends on which which shadows on on the faces. I think that or on. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, it's all just painting, really. Yeah, she says the shadows on the clothes. She um, so yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, usually, usually. You know, like you'll, 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 that, that's probably a situation where you do two firings, you know, like you, you paint what you want, 
to be there and then you paint the shadow on later and refire. I think that answers it. Okay. Just having a lot of comments about how much people are enjoying hearing about your work um, and seeing That's your work in the museum. Um, so I have one of my own questions that I would love to ask that's more about, you did touch on this earlier, but I'm always really interested to hear why artists are drawn to particular mediums. And you kind of talked about how you came to glass, but I'm wondering like, what, what is it about glass specifically that speaks to you? Glass is nature. I mean, it's literally, it's, it's, it is nature. It's made of nature. And then it, it, there's just, there, it, I love what it does. You, anytime you do something with it, it brings something else to it that you weren't expecting. And, and that, and then as you learn all these things that it does, you can use them to your advantage. But yeah, uh, it, I think human beings respond to glass and, and I just, I, I just fell in love with it and I think the biggest thing I like about it is that it it really does things that you didn't intend that make it better so that that's very gratifying <laughs> yeah and you mentioned earlier yeah. the sense of control and kind of letting a piece be done um when you're mm -hmm. painting. so I'm wondering what that feeling is like for you to kind of not have as much control over the piece. I appreciate it because, uh, yeah, it never looks exactly like you think you're, it's going to. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times, because it took so long to get it where you wanted it to go, uh, you kind of hate it for a while because it was just so, it doesn't look like what you thought it should, but then a year later you look at it and you think, ooh, that was, that was really good. But you need to get away from it. It's kind of, <laughs> it's, it's very intense. And uh, that, yeah, the, uh, yeah, I, glass, I like that aspect of it, that it, it just won't let you control it entirely. Yes, I've heard a lot of potters express similar sentiments about it. Um, yes. Which I just think is such a wonderful way to make your artwork more of a collaboration between the medium and yourself um, rather than have it be completely controlled. Um, so we have a few other questions here. Um, one of two of which are actually pretty specific. Um, one is from Ellen who asks which town the, mu the Dakota Museum that you mentioned is closest to. The Aka Lakota is in Chamberlain, Chamberlain. Um, so it's like right in the middle between Sioux Falls and Rapid City. So it's, it's way out there. And it's interestingly um, very close to this trading post where uh, Red Cloud and I, that's where the grandfather that we share was living so it's it's so weird how you learn all these little factoids about the past as you as you go along and then all these weird interrelationships keep coming up and so it really has reconnected me with with my with my tribe and and with people that are so wonderful so yeah I think when um when you have those little moments of reconnection, it's just a sign that you're on the right path, you know, that you're yes. doing the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> it really does feel that way. Yes. Fantastic. Um, and we do have a question about the herd, um, which is coming oh, yes. up in the first weekend of March. Um, and are you going to be there? I am going to be there. And of course, I'm never ready. And so that is, that's the next full-time focus <laughs> which leads yeah. to my next question about um current projects that you're working on current pieces that you're working on um well I showed you two yep that are gonna be there because they're pretty they're pretty much done um well sort of 
And then uh, the other one is going to be, um, yeah, it, it, one of them was cut out there. And so I'm gonna try to get as much done as I can, but yeah, I'm always, I, I've hurt myself staying up till like four in the morning, finishing it on the road to the herd. That is not, in fact, it was, it was the one with the, with the uh, little Inuit girl and the pup. Ooh, yeah, that one, that one went on too long. <laughs> but yeah, that was a hurt thing. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I am so excited to be able to see those works in person, hopefully at the herd. Um, and yes, yeah. So we just continue to have more comments about your wonderful work. Um, and we, unless you have any other questions or things that you would like to share with the audience, I think we're about ready to wrap up. I really have thoroughly enjoyed this and thank you for your interest in my work. It's really gratifying. Yeah, it's so spectacular um, just to see all of the different work in the Clearly Indigenous exhibition. And it is um, my ex first time expanding outside of the Southwest. So it's a really wonderful opportunity for us to put all of these different artists from around the globe in conversation together. And so for those of you who have not seen the exhibition, I would encourage you to come out and see it. Please do keep an eye out for Angela's work when you're going through the exhibition. And I would also encourage everyone to take a look at the wonderful exhibition catalog that the curators produced. Um, oh, there is one more question just to clarify. The exhibition is at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe on Museum Hill. So please do come visit us. Um, we would love to see all of you in person, hopefully sometime soon. And if you're unable to join us in person, please stay tuned for upcoming events with other artists from this wonderful exhibition. So thank you, Angela, for spending your morning with us. Um, and I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of their day.